everyone um, and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via teleconference and our officials will be briefing the committee via teleconference as well. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. Um, members can mute their tablet devices by pressing the F4 button. So apologies um, this morning, we, we know we have apologies from Stuart Dixon who is currently recovering um, from illness and has told the committee he expects to be rejoining us in September. Hopefully so. Um, we aren't aware of any other pol apologies the minute, but chair. John Rodeau may be joining us yeah, a bit later. He's, he's, he's he's apologies chair from Christopher Stanford who oh, right. okay. yeah, is in hospital. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. Gallstones will leave. Oh. Oh, well, best oh, wishes oh. to Christopher, hope he recovers quickly. Right, thank you. Um, okay, so this morning we have one item on the agenda. It's a, an oral briefing, and our papers are at page four from um, your packs. And the briefing is from the department on the monitoring round, and there is a briefing paper on the budget 2020-21 at page five. Um, so welcome to this morning meeting. This morning's meeting. Colin Lewis, head of management services and regulation group and Department for Economy and Sharon Hethington, um, Finance Director at the Department for Economy. So if you guys want to make an opening statement and then we will open it up to members for questions. So the, the paper that members have in front of them this morning describes my department's response to the June monitoring exercise and separately to the Department of Finance-led budget reprioritization exercise. Now, as you'll be aware, the, the monitoring exercise, which typically occurs three times each year, allows departments to realign its budget allocation on the basis of an of emerging need. Uh, the flexibility in budgetary management afforded to departments is normally quite limited. Typically, it is limited to facilitating the reallocation of small amounts without recourse to the Department of Finance and the Executive. However, given the need for departments to respond quickly to address emerging COVID-19 pressures, the Executive agreed that departments should be given complete flexibility to reallocate any non-ring fence budgets to meet emerging COVID-19 pressures. Uh, the paper also reflects my department's response to the Department of Finance-led budget reprioritization exercise, which was completed in tandem with our June monitoring return. This had the objective of identifying possible baseline savings to help fund wider executive COVID-19 budget pressures across the remainder of this financial year. Uh, the paper describes in some detail the, the various easements, budget pressures and reallocations that have been made, and then the further bids that have been made for additional funding. I mean, I won't repeat these in detail now in these introductory remarks, but um, I'll just briefly summarize for you the headline figures. So, in total, uh, and rounded to the nearest million pounds, uh, my minister has approved the reallocation of 30 million pounds of non-ring fence budget to fund emerging COVID-19 budget pressures, made up of 24 million pounds of resource budget and 6 million of capital budget. The minister's emphasis in making these allocations was focused on the medium and longer term recovery and rebuild phases of the department's response to the pandemic. Up to this point, the emphasis has rightly been on the immediate reaction to the pandemic, largely focused on assisting businesses to address cash flow difficulties. The three large grant schemes totaling £410 million, which you're all very aware, aware of, and the non-domestic rates holiday funded by the Department of Finance were targeted in this way. These were truly un unconventional measures as they would fail to adequately satisfy value for money and, and regulatory tests. So the minister is now looking longer term and wishes to do all she can within the confines of her budget to prepare for recovery. She has reallocated 24 million pounds 
a resource easement to address half a million pounds of inescapable, largely uh, statutory obligations, 13.6 million towards the pressures in skills and education, and 9.6 million towards initiatives focused on businesses that are vulnerable but viable. She has re reallocated the six million pounds worth of capital easement to a variety of pressures including £3 million to businesses that are deemed to be vulnerable and viable. The Department has made a number of additional bids, uh, made up of both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 pressures. In the, included in these are £14.7 million of COVID-19 resource bids, which include a bid for £10.7 million to fund higher education loss of commercial research income. Other notable COVID-19 bids include two separate £10 million financial transaction capital bids towards a Tourism NI Game of Thrones studio tour and to invest in I to support early stage companies mitigate the effect of the, the pandemic. We've also made a large non-COVID-19 bid for £25 million of capital grant for the University of Ulster Greater Belfast Development Project. Uh, I mentioned at the outset that the main purpose of the budget reprioritization exercise was to identify baseline savings to help fund the executive's wider budget pressures. My department identified no uh, non ring fence savings. This is hardly surprising given that the department will be at the forefront of the executive's medium and long term economic response to the pandemic. Finally, Chair. Uh, these returns do not seek to address any potential underspends that might arise from each of the three ring fence grant schemes. The Department is not yet in a firm position to give an accurate assessment of the scale of any underspend, as my colleagues are working their way through the appeals process and addressing a legal challenge to the eligibility process specific to the £25,000 grant scheme. In addition to this, uh, my minister will shortly put an options paper to the executive on how any underspends might be utilised. However, these are ring-fenced amounts. The discretion for their use resides firmly with the executive, and I'm quite sure it will have a plethora of a myriad of competing pressures to consider from right across the nine departments. So, Chair, that's a, a quick summary of the paper you have in front of you. Sharon and I will do our best to answer any questions that you might have and provide additional clarification and explanation. Where we can't give you any precise or complete answers, we'll be very happy to write to, you, to the clerk to provide any necessary explanation. So, Chair, that's just a quick counter through and summarise summarize the paper that you have in front of you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that um, and for running through all of that. Obviously, we were aware that there would be um, significant pressures within the department, um, as you say, at the forefront of responding to, to COVID-19 from an economic perspective. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Gordon, do you want to go first there? Right, Chair, sure, yeah. Thanks very much for your presentation this morning, and uh, I found it useful. In relation to Invest in, I understand they, their role will be changing somewhat and that they're about supporting more locally based business in relation to the COVID recovery. Do you have any further details on what is proposed there in relation to, um, I suppose, broadening the remit of Invest in, I, as I would see it? Um, um, uh, Gordon, I think that's slightly straying beyond my capability of answering that. I'll just make a few general comments that it yeah. might be helped. I, I think I think it's it's unlikely that Invest in I um, will change, I suppose, their, their 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 strategy significantly. I think it's probably reasonable to to assume that the potential for foreign direct investment at this time is likely to be constrained somewhat. Yeah. So there would more than likely be a, a, a focus on on the support of existing business to maintain their their, their viability and to encourage uh, small micro businesses to, to 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 first of all to 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 maintain their, their their viability but also to grow. So I can see a natural focus towards that. And if you look, I suppose, at some of the the bids that we have in our monitoring round, there is a, a ten million pounds financial transaction capital bid, and that is primarily focused 
um, on the um, high-end potential startup companies that exist in Northern Ireland. So I think I think it's inevitable that there will be a change of emphasis. I think the overall strategy remains the same, but I can see a, I can see some skewing towards local indigenous as opposed to foreign direct investment. Okay, right. Uh, on tourism then, um, you are, would you see the tourism obviously needing further funding as, the, as things proceed and uh, as business opens up again? What about the promotion of tourism even locally and what, what have we got in there for that, in the bids? If, if you if there are there are a number number of things in there that you, you can see there is one bit in relation to um, tourism research and insights and that that will be about informing um, uh, and tourism and I's marketing activity and development program so there is there is emphasis at, at doing that uh, there's also assistance in there in relation to the the Game of Thrones issue so there's no sense that we are sort of holding back on the promotion of tourism. In saying all of that, Gordon, it's not, it's not going to be easy to, to sell in this environment, particularly yeah. around, particularly around um, the social distancing rules and, and all sorts of, of, of things. You know, uh, but I'm, I'm led to believe, as, as you will probably know, that you know, there are papers with the executive today which may see an opening up of the sector. And when that happens, I think we won't be short in, in trying to channel more money into the promotion of, of Northern Ireland as a tourism destination. Okay, John, thank you. Just on the, the FE colleges, we've had them in, and yeah. they gave us a good comprehensive uh, report, I think, what they're doing. Yeah. They have, obviously, challenges. Um, they're 40% down on their intake at the moment, or their plan yeah. intake. Um, where is the support for them? Um, I see. Well, in, the, in the bids, in the bids that we've seen, uh, that the minister has, has reallocated. There's two. There's two areas where you where you could um, focus on on FE. There's a substantial bid um, that has been met in relation to apprenticeship support uh, and re-engagement. Yeah. A large proportion of what that apprenticeship support uh, entails is delivered through FE. So there is a knock-on impact onto the ability of those colleges to deliver. In addition to that, we recognise that there has been a need to allow um, more online learning. So there is a bid in there for just over a million pounds to support and provide laptops and IT for remote digital access. And that will provide uh, the colleges and training providers uh, more opportunity to provide remote working. So um, I, think, I think the minister has been very conscious uh, Gordon, that up to this point, yeah. the emphasis has been on business, you know, business, and, and quite rightly so. Uh, but if we look more medium and long term, we really do have to support skills and education. I mean, the furlough scheme is coming to an end. We don't know the full scale of the impact that they might have on redundancies, etc. But for sure, if we're seeking to recover and rebuild the economy, we have to be investing in FE and HE. And I think the minister has sought to do this in, the, in, in this in this reallocation. Yeah, thirteen and a half million there then. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, to support them, and that that's priority one. So is that is that committed or likely? Oh, you broke up there, Gordon. Didn't pick that up. Is that committed or likely to be committed? That money. Oh yes, that, yes. The, I mean, we have been given freedom to reallocate it. That has that has already been uh, reallocated into the baselines of the skills and education group in the department. Okay, great. Colin, thanks very much and I think we all are supportive of the FE colleges and the challenges are great now with unfortunate the redundancies that are planned and the reskilling, upskilling, all of those issues are important. So it's important we support them as much as we can. Thanks, okay. Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, if I could just pick up where, where Gordon has left off there. I think it's also important that the the funding has been directed towards PhD students as well, who, who may have to extend, um, and that bid that's going to, to SFI um, yeah. as well in terms of, of the COVID response. Um, I think it's important that we can, you know, that our universities are able to collaborate in, in that way. Um, can I just pick up then the 1.4 million um, for student hard fit that? That's to match the 1.4 that was allocated by the executive. Is that correct? That's that's correct, Chair. Sure. It's two, it's 2.8 in total, so we're simply matching that. Okay, that's great. Um, and the one point. 
five, seven, five. Hold on a wee second, I go back. Um, for higher education. Um, so the the H the NRC delay. Um, what well, is that? Just because of COVID nineteen, is that a delay in the ability to start the project, or what is That's that? Correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, the one point five seven four million to um, uh, the universities in relation um, to the Mazen uplift. Yes. Um, and is that all being directed towards? Um, the narrow STEM subjects. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and do we have any idea in terms of the numbers of students that that is potentially going to um, allow the, the uplift in each of the universities? Um, I don't personally have that detail in front of me, Chair, but I mean, if, if, it, if the clerk wants to write this, we can provide that information. Okay. Um, that's all for me for now. I'll come back in. Gary, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, the, the line's particularly bad this morning for some reason. But, uh, look, I, I think that uh, the majority of it speaks for itself. Um, I, I think there's some welcome things in there, particularly given our recent conversations with the uh, further education colleges. I know that um, I had raised some concerns along with other members around the those that are disadvantaged. And I think that, that, that this uh, bid uh, goes some way to help try and address those challenges. Uh, I suppose um, Gordon has covered uh, some of what I was going to raise, um, but, but I wanted just to, to move uh, to page 16, um, and it's around the, um, the, the capital bid of 25 million for University um, of Ulster Greater Belfast Development. Can I give an explanation, and, and apologies if I'm not understanding this, but it's saying the bid is for a capital grant um, to replace, to part replace 126 million FTC loan. Uh, what is the reasoning for that? Um, the reasoning is that the the FTC loan has has not been processed as such as um, given the, the status of the particular project. Um, in in order to I suppose de-risk the project, but also to to address what um, are anticipated cash flow difficulties, we seek to convert. And 25 million pounds of FTC into capital grant to immediate to immediately uh, release cash into uh, the university to protect its financial uh, sustainability. It is is a merely a mechanism to address uh, cash flow difficulties in the university or emerging cash flow difficulties. If it's, if it's done, then. And those those difficulties will not, will not arise, and it will be easier for the university to, to manage the project. So that's the purpose of this. Mm. Okay. No, and you would appreciate though the concern that um, you know the, 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 this isn't to say there's no, there's not going to be any further issues in the future given the history of this particular project, but also uh, you know for clarification, the 126 million was a loan, a financial transactions loan. Whereas the £25 million pounds will not have to be paid back to the university, is that right? That's, that, that, that's essentially correct. There, there, are, there are always conditions with regard to any intervention, and so far there'll, there'll, there'll be conditions on you know, the project being implemented, etc., etc., because you, then you could trigger clawback, but it does not, mm. ha it does not have the, 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 the financial consequences of a loan, which is essentially a legal agreement to repay money. The capital grant would not have to be repaired, provided that the depart the, the, the project is, is is implemented in line with plan. I have to say, I do genuinely have serious concerns, uh, given the fact that uh, you know uh, we're we're currently trying to fight for um, a university uh, in the northwest. Uh, the concerns around some quarters around the medical school and the fact that you know we need to get that. Uh, on the ground as quickly as possible, and I just see a situation where clearly Ulster University are in a very, are in a very difficult uh, place. I think it's something that should concern all of us. Um, notwithstanding, I appreciate that probably the, the Department for Economy has very little choice in actually doing what they need to do, because what we do want to see is uh, a complete collapse of Ulster University, but at the same time, I think that there's certainly alarm bells here, and I think we just keep a watch on that. Uh, going forward. 
plaintiff's chair. Thanks, Guy. Sinead. Sinead, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yep, yep. yep. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Um, uh, and, and you'll not be surprised, I'm just coming in there straight after Gary about uh, the University of Ulster and the 25 million capital grant. I thought the whole point of getting the FTC was to avoid any hit on the executive's capital budget. Um, and, uh, and I'm just not too sure how, how, how all of this uh, came about. Uh, Colin, maybe you could give us a bit more detail. And to date, how much of a capital grant has gone into that project in Belfast? Um, I, I, you, you probably need a more detailed briefing from the Skills and Education Group in this, but I'll do my best for you, Sinead, okay? Thanks. Um, the, the £126 million pounds worth of FTC is, is obviously to support the completion of the Greater Belfast project. There is a, there is a business plan has, that has been appraised and an offer made and conditions have to be met. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that the university is not yet in a position to meet those, those conditions, so the drawdown of the £126 million pounds of FTC has not yet commenced. Cognizance of that, however, there are obviously ongoing um, 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 cost and um, uh, finance pressures within the university, not least um, because of the fact that there's been a loss of income as a result of the COVID-19 cri uh, crisis. The team here have obviously engaged with the University of Ulster, have identified that there is immediate cash need that would give the university sufficient breathing space, and have decided to su submit a bid. I think that's perfectly reasonable and understandable in the, in the current crisis that, 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 that we have. As to your second part of the question, and, I can, and this is, this is Sinead, rather off the top of my head, so if I'm not absolutely yeah. precise, bear with me. I believe that. Um, up, up to this point, some £16 million pounds worth of capital grant was, was given to the, the university, and, on, and then following that, uh, some £70 million pounds worth of FTC was given to the university in total to fund the Greater Belfast up to this point. This £126 million is the balance of, of that, 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 that amount to fund, to fund the project. But as you uh, would be aware, that we're very concerned because today is the, the decision day in relation to McGee as well. So we're all waiting with bated breath in relation to yeah. um, the yeah. sign up for the medical school. So um, we'll watch with interest. And then the other, the other. Um, I mean, I'm delighted about um, the reprofiling of money towards FE and yeah. higher education and the math and etc. Um, um, one little concern, I, I, I was hoping for a more ambitious apprenticeship programme and more money profiled in that direction. Um, is it possible to, to, to look at the apprenticeship uh, spend and see if we can do something more ambitious? Because I do feel that that's going to be an area where we're going to have to fight our, on our recovery. Um, well, making the general point, I think, first of all, the Minister has recognised that looking longer term, we really do need to think more about investment in the, in the supply side as opposed to um, investment on the um, reactive business side. And, and I suppose this monitoring round is, is a, an example. We have, we have looked at the bids that were submitted by the Skills and Education Group and, we've, uh, and the allocation that to the, of the £4 million to, to apprentice support is, meets their retirement in, uh, uh, requirement in full. They haven't asked us for any more at this stage. I would suggest, however, that as the year goes uh, goes on, and we maybe look at again at this in October, which will be the next morning round, there could well be <clears throat> more uh, reallocations to skills and education as the recovery and rebuild phase really begin to kick in. So I don't think there's any um, reticence on our part not to, to fund it. I just think they've identified what they need for now. And then they will look at again, uh, look at this again as we go through the year. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Well, and just in relation to that, I, I yeah. assume you maybe don't have the detail of what is being um, bid for specifically in relation to apprenticeships in terms of, of the actual programmes. Oh, I think, Chair, it's, I mean, there's two elements that there's two elements to support here. One, we, I mean, obviously we, we rely not only on FE colleges, but we also re re rely on external training providers yeah. to provide, to provide the, the training. We have to keep them 
solvent and viable. If, if they're not there, that gives us a major headache uh, as to how this would be de developed. So it's one part of all of this. Um, the second part is, I mean, we are very, we're, 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 we're quite concerned about the number of redundant apprenticeships that are just going to be sitting there doing nothing. We want to keep them engaged. Um, so we are funding them as far as we can and, as, uh, and as, as what we're being asked to do at this present moment. But I foresee, I foresee, to be honest with you, probably more likelihood of this happening later on in the year. If that answers your question. Yeah, no, it was just like we've had some briefing around apprenticeships um, and some of the asks, I suppose, from industry and employers is the support going to the employer to keep the apprentices on. And I was wondering if that was included in this bid. Well, I, I would say to you that would that would be on the money. That's the sort of thing that we should be doing. And I can't believe that that wouldn't be looked on favourably. Thank you. Um, and you see in relation, sorry, I'm jumping back and forward through this paper here, um, but you see in relation to the higher education loss of commercial research income, yeah. was that bid developed along with the universities in terms of what their ask was around it? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, you know, I suppose the, the lifeblood of our universities to a large extent and their success in, 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 generating, in gener generating income and also longer term economic benefit is the research income yeah. that um, that uh, they need to secure that has dried up yeah. and therefore we need we need to we need to research support those research that's uh, research work going forward because it is vital vital to the to the economy no oh, absolutely and i think we would, we would all support that um claire uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, yesterday, the, the Minister of Finance um, circulated um, a note to, to members in relation to um, an advance from the Northern Ireland Consolidated Fund. And it says, in spite of managing all significant payments were possible, um, it's, it's been agreed that uh, £36 million, um, would be needed to the Department for the Economy. Um, could, could you maybe give me um, a bit of an explanation as to why you know that that has been needed or is necessary? Yeah, if, 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 yes, uh, if I can, I will. Yes, I mean, obviously, the demand for cash has been quite extraordinary in the last um, quarter. Uh, totally unconventional. Yeah. Uh, the big schemes coming in, a lot of cash required very, very quickly. The mm. budget, the budget bill has not received its royal assent quickly enough. So okay. there are forecasts for cash. Have therefore been pushed. Uh, 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 not, been, not, in, not inaccurate. They, they were accurate, but because of this delay, um, okay. we therefore are under some pressure. So therefore, we have taken uh, the prudent move of seeking cash cover from the centre. And I, I, I note this morning that the, uh, the finance minister has approved that. Yeah, um, so essentially it's a cash flow issue within the, the Department cash. of Economy, really just due, due to extenuating circumstances related Correct. to COVID-19. Is that because the Department for the Economy, you know, perhaps more than other departments, had significant spending um, in and around some of the supports that they were offering to businesses? Um, I'm just... I'm not sure if there's any other departments that have applied for this or receiving this, or... Well, I think, I think, I think it'd be accurate for me to say that the response, other than the Department of Health, of course, which is first and foremost and, and, and really in the forefront of, of the response to the public health issue, in terms of economic response, sorry, economic reaction, response and rebuild, it's here, it's this department and the, 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 the £410 million pounds worth of grant schemes have been um, uh, filtered through and administered by this department. On top of that, I think you'll probably all have received a copy of our of our COVID-19 response business plan, um, mm -hmm. which, and if you read that, and, and it is on our internet site, it's, it's quite a complex document that really sort of summarizes the vast amount of things that we're doing over and above those um, um, grant schemes. So I, I would say, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just saying this for parochial reasons, we are mm -hmm. at the forefront of this and will be going forward. And, and I made my open remarks that we're not in a position to start surrendering any non-ring fenced monies because we're going to need it in terms of rebuilding the economy going forward. Yeah, I suppose that's a good follow-on from my next question. Does this suggest that there is limited resources 
to, to extend any of the, the existing funds, namely the hardship fund. There's uh, myself and a number of members on this committee and indeed MLAs across the House were quite concerned that it didn't stretch particularly to, to sole traders and, and those businesses that um, really haven't received any support, and I mean that even down to welfare. Yeah. Um, so, so is this a suggestion that the department doesn't have the money to do that and we can't expect anything uh, moving forward in that regard? Well... In, answer, in answering that question, and, and bear with me because the policy responsibility sure. is one of my colleagues, uh, my colleagues in this, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to answer it. Um, I think very best endeavours were made at the outset in rapid time to assess the demand for the three grant schemes. Mm -hmm. um, and these were, these were based on uh, Department of Finance, Land and Property Service um, databases. And um, quite proper assessments were made as to potential drawdown of um, of uh, the grant. Um, in, in the event, the demand has not been as was anticipated. Now, that's not to say that there hasn't been excessive demand. There has been a lot of demand. There's lots of businesses have, have applied and, 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 and got the grants. I have absolutely no doubt that there will be some underspend um, mm -hmm. uh, in relation to these. And you and other MLAs have, of course, been writing to the minister in respect of all of that. I mean, the, the, the volume of correspondence in this department has just <laughs> grown hugely as a result of all of that. That's fine. You're <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, we, we'll deal with it the best we possibly can. Yeah. There will probably be an underspend. I don't know if it, you could characterise it as being, you know, certain categories left out. They, they, my colleagues assessed this as the demand. The demand necessarily has no reason. I know my minister will be putting a further paper to the executive, which will include other policy okay. options around utilising any underspend. But of course, our, this will be for the executive to determine because they are their ring fenced amounts, and I'm absolutely no doubt uh, from from just from my intelligence that the pressures that exist from right across um, departments probably will out, will will significantly outweigh the amount of money that they'll have to spend. So. There'll be, a, there'll be a test for the executive here as to whether they would accept our policy options, which will include, I would have thought, options around self-employed and things like that, or will, they, will that money be taken back into the centre and used for other things? Yeah, no, and I appreciate that, and I do appreciate the Minister's um, uh, kind of focus in and around this area, and I understand the constraints in relation to it. Um, I suppose there are models in other regions of the United Kingdom yeah, where sure. it maybe uh, provided a limited um, amount of funding just to support those businesses that do seem to be left out here. And I, and I appreciate maybe there is an element where we can't satisfy everyone, but I have a concern that some businesses, you know, and, and rightly so, are, are getting support, and then there are some who are getting nothing to the point that they have literally zero income. And I I think even from a, a kind of welfare perspective, we have to be so conscious of that. But I do look forward to any opportunities where we can um, try and find what hasn't been taken up, um, where there are uh, maybe understands in other areas of the department, and, and if we can help those individuals. So thank you. Uh, well, I think, Claire, can I just make one point? I think yeah. I, I, I believe, Chair, that the minister will be the minister's briefing you this week. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, it may be an opportunity, you know, she can elaborate further on her thinking with regard to those options at that meeting then. That would be helpful, thank you. Okay. Um, Colin, just in relation to any money that's returned to the centre from, from those um, grant schemes funding, how quickly can the bids be then processed to reallocate that? Um, that's not a question for me, Chair. That'll be a question for the Minister for Finance. I mean, uh, look, but I think... In everything that has happened thus far, things are being dealt with at pace here. So I, I don't think it's in anybody's um, um, uh, interests to delay the uh, reallocation of any monies in the centre. In saying that, look, I'm, I'm not clearly that's a matter for the Department of Finance, and it'll be a, a matter for the executive as to when papers are taken. But I would have thought I would have thought that we're, you know, there would, there would be a need to to recycle funding as quickly as possible. Um, John died. Uh, morning, Chair. Apologies for being late. Um, I ran into a bit of difficulties. Uh, apologies if these points have already been made. Um, can I just ask in relation to uh, page 13 uh, in, in the pack, in, in the funding allocations, um, we have 2.124 million going bid for. Invest in I or allocation invest in I. 
and that appears to me to be a COVID-19 bid. We then move on to page 17, uh, and there is a bid rather than an allocation for $1.5 million for SMEs. Why were the SMEs not included in the response to COVID-19? Um, the, uh, uh, the, the decision is taken here, John, is that uh, um, the minister decided to, well, it, first of all, it was included in, in the, the bid for COVID-19. What the, what the department has done, it, it, it sought bids from, from right across the department and analysed those in a, in, a, in a systematic way to determine what are the best bids in relation to uh, value for money, uh, relevance to COVID-19, etc. The bid that you see is simply as a result of the fact that we simply don't have enough money at the present moment to fund those, so we're putting it into the centre. But it was regarded as a, a, a legitimate and strong bid. The minister could have decided to take less money, uh, to, to take not to fund children education by as much and give it that. But I think that that was her judgment that she felt that the investment in skills and education warranted more at this stage. No, and I appreciate it balancing priorities in a limited budget. Uh, I appreciate the challenges a minister faces in around that. But just to clarify, so in terms of the two point odd million, which is allocated to invest in I, that was bid for under the COVID-19 crisis and awarded on that basis. Correct, yes. And was there a bid made for SME? Yes, there was, yes. And what was that bid for? That's that's for the, that was for the 1.5 million there you have in, on the table. Yes, but no, and I'm talking about when the executive was responding initially to COVID-19 and there was allocation of funding. So I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about when when the executive was responding to COVID-19, uh, which when I assume this is when this invest in I yes. was, made, was there a bid made for SME funding then? Yes. Yes, I, 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 I don't have the detail in front of me, but I assume that there was a whole variety of bids made by ourselves and departments at that time. The funding that we were allocated obviously focused entirely on the hardships, uh, the 410 million pounds of support to business, and then subsequently the 1.4 million in relation to student hardship. Yeah, well, and I welcome the fact that the department is much funding the 1.4 yeah. million pounds for the student hardship. I knew you that money starts to raise somewhere, Paul, and you would release it eventually. <laughs> uh, but in terms of, let me just clarify this point then. Could the minister have allocated uh, funding to SMEs previously? No. From she the COVID-19 funding? No, no, she can't. She couldn't. She couldn't. Do, she can only do that in, in, as part of this June monitoring exercise. Right, so the COVID-19 fund was allocated as per uh, the bid from the department, so it was broken down into the issue of SNI, whatever it may be, it was all broken down that way? Yes. Right, so now you've made this bid for SME funding. For, so can I come back to the, the communication campaign? Yes. Um, there is a concern that uh, given the impact COVID-19 has had on the global economy, that foreign direct investment will not be as free-flowing as it once was. Now, that could be an argument for a very strong communication campaign and you go after whatever's there. But there's also a strong argument that uh, money now invested in indigenous businesses and small medium enterprises would be the best way forward. Is a communications campaign at this stage uh, the best use of public funds? I just think, listen, uh, you I probably want my support of my colleagues in answering this, but I'll give you my op opinion on this. And, um, I think it, over the course of the um, recovery and rebuild phase, businesses in all shapes, sizes, and forms are going to be crying out for instruction and guidance and assistance, whether, it is, whether John, it's signposting to existing uh, policy instruments or grant schemes or anything emerging in relation to how the working practices are going to have to change. People look for central support and guidance. I think we all sometimes worry when we see money spent on marketing and promotion campaigns. You think, well, is, is that having a real value? In this circumstances, John, 
I would tend to be of the view that that's probably money well spent, and I think businesses will be will will appreciate the direction and advice that they will receive, and that's this is what this is about. And, and this money has to be spent within this financial year, doesn't it? That's correct. Yeah. It's quite a significant. And if you use a program sipping ready, it's in base DNA, a program sipping ready to run. Yeah, they have. They have. They have already. Um, obviously, these 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 bids are on the basis of business cases that have already been developed. These are not speculative sums, so there is plans behind all of this. So they have been working on communication strategy and plans with the executive office. So this is this is primed, ready to go. I'm sure it'll be refined a little bit, but there's no suggestion that the money will not be spent this financial year. If, in fact, there's any slippage, it will be dealt with in the next monitoring round. I'm sorry, Chair. Just, just one other point on this. So let me clarify, Colin. Is this funding to garner new business or to assist existing business in uh, mopping its way through the current crisis? Is it, uh, uh, to outreach to new business or, or to support existing business? My understanding is there's an element of both, John, but the emphasis is on the, is on the latter as opposed to the former. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Colin. Um, thank you, thank you. I, I guess actually that's something we, we would want to take up with Invest NI yeah, because like, my view around all of that, we, we, there's a need for strong communication to business and to, to people in general about everything that is happening at the minute um, and maybe need for less emphasis perhaps on the, the FDI side of things, but that's something we can take up with Invest. Um, is that us? Then? That's everyone who's, who's, who's highlighted, Chair, yeah. Um, Colin, look, thank you for that. Can I, can I just ask oh, a yes, question? Colin, is there a legal challenge on a on a grant on the on the scheme there? You reckon the twenty five k grant is that right? Ongoing legal challenge? Yes, Ms. Gordon, there is a there is an ongoing legal challenge against the eligibility uh, rules around the twenty five thousand pound grant grant scheme. This will be a challenge as to the process that was ident- um, followed by the department. These things are not unusual, particularly in these unconventional times, yeah. um, because there will be business who will quite rarely say that they should they should be awarded a grant, and it's 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 not fair for one reason or another. I'm not here to to argue one way or the other, but there is a there is a, a a legal case ongoing which could have financial consequences. It may not, but yeah. you needed to be aware of it just you know, for to be open and transparent about what the situation is. And is it an individual business that's taken the case? A number of businesses. A number of them, is it? Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Colin. Um, and all of these bits, this is the uh, what has been submitted to DOF, yeah? Yes, all of these all of these papers were submitted to DOF Friday Friday week ago. The internal reallocations, Chair, we can deal with ourselves and, and, and obviously... Yeah. They have already been dealt with. We would intend, Chair, to um, no, normally in monitoring rounds, as you know, the, the Minister for Finance, in pulling in all the inputs from departments, would make some sort of announcement um, through the assembly. Mm-hmm. That's, I, I don't. I really do not know what the plans are there, but we would seek. We would want to to be quite open and transparent about what we have done. So we would plan to communicate this shortly. That's great. Look, thank you very much. I think that that's us from us now. Thank you. Chair, Chair um, just to say, um, I, I apologise. I have done all the speaking there, and Sharon <laughs> maybe has not given the opportunity to say it. Sharon, would you like to make any comment at all? No, Colin. I think you covered that all very well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you both. Thank you, Nigel. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I should probably just say Sharon replaced Stephen McMurray, um, number one. Okay. I've not heard of her before. Okay. Um. Chair, one thing um, I need to seek members' permission to do mm-hmm. is forward on those papers to the Finance Committee. Um, is there any additional commentary that members would like to make um, in terms of the, um, the papers as they stand? Uh, the Finance Committee, as, as members will recall, has a, um, a central role in responding generally to the the June monitoring round and are welcoming inputs from individual committees. Um, Are are members content that 
uh, the committee indicates that it's generally satisfied with the way the department has handled the process in terms of internal um, reallocations and the bids that it's made. Yes, because I think it is important that the, the funds were directed towards supporting businesses and FE and HE. I think we would be generally supportive of that. Are members content? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, John. John. John, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I just want to, the one thing that isn't clear to me is how the minister weighted her decisions. What did she use or what measures did the minister uh, use to decide which were priority areas? And it may, it may be the case that there was no waiting use, there's no effort, there's no onus on any minister to do that. But for instance, uh, w why did the minister choose to allocate funding to A and not to B? So I'm wondering, is, is this a, I think it's a question we can ask, uh, was there a waiting uh, used to, to reach the decisions or what was the, what was the rationale behind the decisions there? Chair, um... Can I answer that? Oh. So, go ahead. Hello. Um, no, I, I agree with um, John, and I think potentially this is what's giving rise to legal action. You know, what is the process? What's the grid? What's the standard? Um, you know, you, I, I voiced similar concerns at the start of all of this that I'm not sure of the consistency around it. I'm, I'm not entirely surprised that we, we have had legal actions from some uh, quarters, if not more than what we're being told. Um, so, you know, I, I do think there is a value in understanding how these decisions were made from a, almost from a, a, a quantitative approach, forgive me, I'm not a scientist, um, rather than a qualitative one in the sense that, you know, is, is this consistent? You know, are people being treated fairly? I know from a constituency perspective, you know, we, we've challenged a number of these decisions and have got quite a few successes, which would suggest to me that the, that the application of this hasn't been entirely consistent. So we, obviously we have the Minister in with us on yeah. Wednesday, so we can yeah. broach that with her as well, but we can also ask the Department for you know some sort of um, criteria yeah, based Chair, there, there's, um, there will have been a process, there's always a process, um, so we can seek clarification on that. Um, can I come in here too? Sorry. Yes, go yep. ahead, Sinead. Um, I would just concur with, with uh, Claire and, and John. It's very hard. And I suppose all members of our, the committee found this, um, you know, through the whole budgeting process, etc. It's very hard to get scrutiny when you actually don't know the process, um, where the department, um, you know, how, how do they prioritise? Now, I'm not, I'm not questioning because I do think that there's been good emphasis on education and skills uh, and that, but you know, it, it's difficult to understand the process. <laughs> Again, I'm. I'm concerned about, you know, the, the allocation of, of capital funds for Ulster University. You know, could that have been better spent uh, allocating it to um, the, a, a major apprenticeship programme? I just don't understand the process. Uh, and, 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 you know, is there a process? Is there, you know, do we do zero-based budgeting, for example, within departments? Because we just seem to, you know... <laughs> I'm not just saying it's going and got, but you know, um, it, it really doesn't seem to me that there is um, a, a priority processing going on. Maybe there is, I don't know. But I'm on the committee and I don't know. Chair, if it's helpful, we can um, dig into that process. I, I think just even from comments Colin had made, uh, there, there's obviously a lot of programming that is there and can't be touched if the money's spent it, it goes on in that program other um, easements have been identified um, in the paper because of COVID-19 where money can't be spent and those have then been reallocated by the department within the um, within its own funds on the basis of prioritization now it's, it's probably that prioritization then that that members are really seeking information on um, other than that, the, the broader issue of the, the funds and the schemes and the grants themselves, um, obviously we can seek further clarification from the department, but I think there was some element of um, criteria-based modelling done by the Department of Finance where nominal numbers were, were, were gathered of people who might be eligible for a claim, making the claim and then matching the number of those that can be allowed into the criteria to the, the amount of money that was available. But again, 
we will seek um, clarification on those points as well. And obviously, Chair, as you've said, the Minister's in on um, Wednesday, so it might be a case of members asking her if, there, if there's an ability for her to indicate um, specific priorities of hers to, you know, in different programmes no. and so on. So we will we'll pursue all those clarifications. Other than that, are, are members content we pass this paper on to the Finance Committee? And indicate that we're seeking clarifications. Agreed. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, that's really it for this morning. It is. Unless yeah. anyone has any other business. Oh, okay. So the date, time, and place of our next meeting is Wednesday morning in room thirty at ten a.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.